while I'm live for the first time. Pretty nervous. Not gonna, not gonna lie to you. Uh, been a little nervous all morning. Well, you know, I think uh, we'll get used to it, and hopefully you'll get used to it. I'll have to get used to looking in the camera, not at me. Uh, I have some questions that everyone, uh, that a few people have sent in, so I will address those. Uh, I'm also, I'm taping on my camera, on my phone right now. I have everything, uh, Facebook up on my computer to see if there's any questions that come in, because sometimes I think, uh, I've noticed from watching other Facebook lives, it's hard to see. Um... But first I wanted to start off by saying I was on vacation last week and it was incredible. Uh, my husband and my two kids and I went to the Adirondack Mountains to this tiny little town called Wells, New York. Uh, and it really helped. I found my creativity was waning. So it really helped with my uh, creativity and reigniting it and having some new ideas. And um, I was very excited to come back this past Tuesday and jump right in. Uh, to the big birthday sale, which has been generating some interest um, and all of that. Uh, and in my newsletter tomorrow, I'm going to write about uh, a little bit more about what we did and how uh, certain things that we did reminded me of a job search or uh, working in a job that you don't like or um, when you know you want to change your career, but you don't really know what it is and that whole path and journey to finally finding it. Um, so we'll also want to note that any uh, links to articles, uh, links to products, uh, links to free resources that I talk about, I will include in the comment section after the video. I am also going to post the video on my site with some like show notes uh, and the any of the links on there as well. Okay, let's get to the first question, and that is uh, actually one that was pretty common. I got a few questions surrounding this, and it's all about the what to do after an interview. Uh, and do you send a follow-up email? Do you send a thank you email? Who do you send it to? What if you don't have there? Like so many different questions about essentially after the interview. So yes, please send a thank you email to every single person you interview with. Okay, that's, that is key. Uh, ideally, you probably got business cards from them uh, and then you have your, their email address so that makes it simple, uh, super easy and simple. Uh, if you don't have business cards, then another way to do it is to check on LinkedIn because chances are you have their full name and you can uh, send a connection request with a little send a note and you can do a little thank you uh, blurb in there. Uh, or alternatively, whoever scheduled the interviews, was it the hiring manager or recruiter, recruitment coordinator, uh, agency recruiter, whoever it was, you can ask them to forward the thank you email on on your behalf, okay? Um, now what to put into a thank you email um, there's a lots of different things. You want to start off with a greeting, obviously, then a little bit of a thank you for taking the time to meet with you. Uh, then you want to talk about something of note. So this is something that perhaps you two connected on. Maybe it's a shared hobby. Maybe you both are runners or maybe you both have kids that just started school this week. Or uh, maybe you know someone, you have a, someone uh, in your network that has shared or went to the same university. Any sort of, of that overlap that you perhaps discussed. Uh, or anything of yours that they were incredibly excited about or anything that they talked about that was incredibly insightful. So something that just stands out as memorable it allows you to remind them of that sort of connection that you two have. And then you're going to talk about how you're a great fit for the job. You're going to reiterate your excitement for the role. Uh, and then just a looking forward to next steps or looking forward to the offer if you're at that point. And then thanking them again and uh, uh, sign off. So like really, really simple, nothing to, to think about, um, but just something that is key. And honestly, not many people send a thank you. 
you shockingly like to me shockingly because to me it's like you, you just do it like you don't you don't even have to think about it um, but it's an easy way to get you remembered now can you the other question that sort of went along with this is can you follow up after that if you haven't heard anything yes you can for sure now for um example that i do want to use some examples but there is some caveats and buts uh, you don't want to be a nuisance because then you don't want to turn them off you at any at any point in time um, but you can figure out did they state a timeline at the end of the interview if did you ask about next steps um, did they say they'll get back to you at the end of the week anything like that uh, my go-to is a typical 24 to 72 hours after that timeline so for example if they said uh, we should know by the end of the week then 24 to 72 hours would be sometimes between Monday to, to Wednesday of next week or the week after that you would send a follow-up email if they said oh we should know by midweek then it's Friday or Monday okay and you um, email the person who says who they said would get back to you so if it's the recruiter if it's the hiring manager um, usually it's the recruiter uh, that makes the, the most sense they're usually coordinating the whole interview process and coordinating the offer process uh, and all you want to do in that email in terms of a format is again a greeting again thanking them for their time either for meeting with you or for coordinating all of the interview process uh, remind them of the timeline so you say something along the lines of, I know you were hoping to get feedback to candidates, or I know you were completing your interviews um, by the end of the week. You know, just looking to follow up on that. Something simple like that. Uh, and then you're looking for feedback because you are still very interested. So again, reiterating that interest and in why you want that, that job, maybe with a little snippet, not too much, of why you're a great fit for the role and for the company. And then again, thanking them and, and signing off. Okay, uh, I hope all of that in terms of interview follow up makes sense. Um, I think keeping those lines of communication open is great, uh, and especially the follow up in terms of getting that feedback is so much easier when you send the thank you note because you've already opened up that door of communication through email, you've already started engaging people, um, and it's completely okay to do that. So the next question is a long one. Okay, this came uh, from Catherine on LinkedIn, uh, and it's a specific, but I know it's something that a lot of people feel and a lot of people um, go through. And this is about those lengthy job searches. So searches that last for three months plus, um, can be uh, a couple of years, um, it really depends on the situation and it, but honestly a lot of these feelings can happen after just even a few weeks so backing up it's all about how to stay inspired during a job search that's lengthy and demoralizing uh, and staying inspired in a way to be successful so in order to land that dream job so I want to break this question down to two parts I want to talk about the tangible aspect of what you can do and then I want to talk about the emotional aspect of what you can do okay so the tangible first are those practical things the practical things that you should do to review what you have been doing to see what is working and what isn't because you can't fix something if you don't know what needs to be fixed uh, if anything needs to be fixed at all and chances are if it's been more than the, the average three to six months, then something needs to be looked at. So the first thing is, let's see if your resume is working for you. So take a look at your applications. So you can look at as little as the last 10 applications. Um, ideally, I like to even look at the last 50 applica applications to relevant jobs. So this isn't where you're sort of taking a chance because that doesn't always really count. Um, or uh, applying for a position that you aren't necessarily a fit for. These are the ones that you probably should have been given an interview for. So you take a look at those 50. 
how many of those called you for an interview? Simple. Okay. What is your ratio? The normal ratio, normal, is about one interview per five applications sent out. Now, certain situations, certain jobs, certain industries, certain locations even, that doesn't always stand uh, out or stand true. One in 10 for a lot of people is a very normal and realistic job ratio. One in 25 even. Um, you can Facebook message me if you feel like you are in a different situ or a unique situation uh, and I'll let you know and so that you have that understanding and that knowledge so you can really assess correctly. So if you say have a one in 10 ratio, what was it about that one or if you're looking at the 50, the five interview requests that you got from five different companies, what was it about your resume that you think made you stand out? How was the application process? Was it emailed directly to a person or was it through an applicant tracking system? Uh, what industry was it in? Where, what location? Uh, what company size? Was it a large company, medium size, small? There's so many different factors that you can assess to see where is it you are having the most success at. Um, and that way you can maybe target the, your search in terms of your job applications, in terms of your networking to those specific areas. Now, the other thing to think about is if you should be at a one to five and you are at a one to 10, then let's take a look at the, your resume. What is going on with your resume that is not exciting um, the recruiter enough to pick up the phone? So taking a look at the articles on a link, like I said below, uh, the winning resume, optimizing it for an applicant tracking system, and the modern resume. Is it suitable for in-person readers? Is it suitable for um, uh, applicant tracking system readers, like the resume bots? Making sure that it is the correct one um, and in the correct format that will get everyone wanting to pick, in, pick up the phone and give you a call. Okay. That is essentially the resume piece. You're also going to want to look at your cover letter. Did you include cover letters on the ones you got interviews for? If not, um, what was there a difference in the cover letter? Um, I'm really noticing what really works for cover letters in getting them to increase the number of interviews is that conversational tone, not being, not going to what job here or whatever the cover letter samples that are all over the place now. Um, like, no. They're very monotonous, very boring. They do not wake a recruiter up. They do not excite a hiring manager to give you a call. So what can you do to in, infuse your personality? I'll also link to the secrets to an engaging cover letter so that you can uh, see that because I provide some tips on, on how to do that. Um, now, that's the first thing I want you to do in terms of the tangible aspects, uh, reigniting uh, your job search when it becomes lengthy so that you continue to stay inspired. The second thing I want you to do is the networking piece. Okay. First of all, please, I hope you have a networking strategy. If not, you got to start one right away. Uh, number two, what is that networking strategy? What is that networking action plan that you've been following? Um, what has been working? What hasn't been working? Again, it's the same sort of thing. Looking at what networking conversations that you've had that have led to, to actual job leads and why? What was it about those conversations? What was it about those people? What was it about the emails that you sent out that got people willing to talk to you? Taking a look at all of those, just like you did with the resume and the job applications to see, is there anything you can mimic with future networking conversations to increase the likelihood of all of that happening? Okay. Um, if you don't have a networking action plan, then start one um, and start with baby steps in your current network. First thing you do is you're, let's reconnect with people you already know. You ask them to catch up, you ask to chat, you're not asking for a job, it's just simply um, have, have some time, want to use it want to talk to talk to you let's can i buy you a coffee can we want to go out for after work drinks can i buy you lunch um and you know 
was with old colleagues and coworkers, uh, previous managers, especially references, uh, anyone you've met, friends that could even be of help. Uh, those are the great, those conversations are great to have at the beginning of networking because it's sort of like an easing your way into it. It's a nice, easy step in. Then you go into creating new network connections. This is the scary part, but these are, this is where the magic happens. So this is the informational interviews, going to networking events, going to meetup groups. There's so many meetup groups, which is sort of a new world to me that I'm learning through my clients, especially anyone in engineering, anyone in IT, um, uh, admin, there's some meetup groups. So going to these meetup groups to uh, meet up with some new people and just talk. You see if you can help them. They see if you can help, if they can help you. Um, hi, Michelle. Thank you for joining us. We have a few more people here. Um, but... Uh, I think if you get out of your comfort zone and go to these different networking events, a lot of associations have the different networking events. Uh, and don't worry about just meeting people that you think you should be meeting, like hiring managers um, or people within a company that you want to. Meeting with other people looking for a job is great because you're in the same boat. Um, one of my clients has a networking buddy where they go to networking events together, they create challenges and goals, and they keep each other accountable for it because they're both introverts, they both don't like networking, but they both know that they need to to help find them a job. And it's been very successful for them. So anything that you can do to help you feel better with the, with the networking piece. Um, and so, and we'll get into the emotional aspect of staying inspired during a, a lengthy job search, but Talking with people is a great way, um, not only to help you find a job, but to keep your spirits up. The last thing that the tangible aspect that I want to talk about, about uh, during those lengthy job searches when you're feeling very demoralized uh, and the other sort of tangible thing that you can examine to see if it will help is your interviews. Um, so taking a look at the interviews you've had and how they went. It, again, same with the networking, same with the resumes and, and job applications. What's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, a lot of times people feel that the interview went great and then they never hear anything. So to be completely blunt uh, and honest is most hiring managers don't want to be the bad guy. So unfortunately, they will make you feel like the interview went amazing. And they will leave it to the recruiter to be the bad guy. Um, most hiring manager, like if, if they're not interested in you, there is no need for them to feel like they need to coach or groom or mentor you during that interview. Um, so they will just ask the questions that you answer. They won't ask they won't ask any follow-up or probing questions. They'll just sort of go. Um, so I know like that doesn't sound uh, like ideal. I know it doesn't feel good that that is the case. Um, but no, it's probably you're just not a fit in some way for their team in terms of skills or, or personality. And sometimes with the personality, it's not like you don't have like a good personality. A lot of times too, uh, hiring managers are looking at the, the team. So, and what the team's strengths and weaknesses are. And when there's a new hire, they're looking at that as an opportunity to offset some of the weaknesses and to strengthen uh, some of the other areas. So perhaps you are almost exactly like someone else on the team. So they're not gonna hire you because of that, because you don't bring anything new to the table. Uh, so it has nothing really to do with you. Uh, and a lot of times that is the case. So there's a lot you can't control but there is still a lot you can. So if you're looking at your stories, well, first of all, are you answering your questions in a story format, uh, which is key. Um, and when you're looking at all of those examples, are they compelling? 
were the hiring managers or the interviewers engaged in any way throughout what you were telling? Um, are they robust enough? So a lot of times behavioral style questions come across as very vague and big picture. You tell me about a, a time when you had a disruptive client. Um, sometimes people then answer in a very vague way and the hiring manager interviewer doesn't probe. But what they want is you to provide a robust answer about exactly what the, the situation was. Why was this client unhappy and disruptive? What was it that you did to turn that situation around? And then what was the result of it in a detailed way, in a compelling way, um, in a way that you would tell your friends? So definitely that's something that I think uh, is one area to look at. Another is the questions. Uh, are you asking very like boring, mundane questions? Um, such as a normal question I always hear is, um, why don't you tell me more about the position? Well, probably they've already told you. And so they kind of an, are, get annoyed that you did not listen properly to them. Um, it's also super vague, doesn't sound like you're really interested. Um, so make sure you're going in prepared with uh, six to nine questions uh, that are about the company, about the team, about the job that shows that you did your research, shows that you're interested and shows that you can think in a business strategic way. Okay. Um, the other thing is to make sure you are not sounding robotic, to make sure that you are um, sounding authentic and genuine, that you have uh, a good story in terms of tell me about yourself, the why you want to work here, um, all those, all those things. Okay. Uh, so looking at those three things and how you have done will help you figure out what it is to, um, what it is that, sorry, I got distracted by, uh, seeing people I know coming on here. Hello. <laughs> um, those three things, looking at your job applications, looking at networking and looking at interviews, uh, will give you the information you need to see what has been going wrong in this lengthy job search so that you can fix something that like in a tangible way that increases the likelihood of you from your job applications, getting more interviews, from your networking, getting more job leads and from your interviews, getting more offers. Okay. That's the tangible aspect of staying inspired during a lengthy job search. Now for the emotional aspect. Um, I know I've, I talk. I can go on for hours about the emotional aspect. It's my psychology major in me, um, but I also have written about it in the past. Uh, and the, there are, the problem is, is what happens. And I see, I've seen this a lot as a recruiter and I definitely see it a lot as a career coach is the longer a job search goes on, the more negative and jaded you become. Um, you get tired of the whole process. Even when you're sending out applications, you get into your head, why am I even bother? I'm not going to get an interview for this. You go into an interview and you're like, why am I, this is a waste of my time. I've done so many interviews. I haven't gotten a single offer. Um, and it seeps in every aspect of your job search. Uh, and so of course, and you stop networking altogether because it's a waste of time. So of course, once that happens, you, um, it's like you're setting yourself up for failure. No one's going to hire a negative Nancy who doesn't want to even do anything. No one's going to hire someone who goes in and starts blaming everything about the, the job search world today on why they're not getting a job. And that I've gone through interviews where it is all about that. And that is not a good mindset to be in when you're struggling to find a job and you've been job searching for a year. Um, and I understand there's a, and in terms of the psychology behind it all, it's a self defense mechanism. Like you, it's a way for you to, to cope with the fact that you're constantly getting rejected, which is horrible and demoralizing and the worst thing anyone can go through. So like, I completely understand that. That's why you have to take care of yourself. Uh, take care of your positive attitude 
throughout the job search. And this is starting from day one. It does not matter how long you've been searching. You got to take care of yourself. Uh, keep that positive attitude from day one so that you are in the right mindset that people want to hire. So the three main areas of focusing is number one on your, um, your health. So I'm going to do a whole series of posts on health within your career and within your job search. But number one is sleep. People don't sleep enough. Like honestly, they do not. As an adult, we should be getting eight hours of sleep a night or seven to nine hours of sleep tonight. But what people don't realize is if your goal is to get eight hours of sleep, you need to go to bed at eight and a half hours before you need to wake up because you're going to need about half an hour to, for your brain to, to shut down. So getting in that sleep, moving, exercising, going for a walk. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, going for a walk, go, whatever it is, swim, Zumba, like just getting out, moving, uh, getting outside. If you can get into the woods, that would be the best because trees uh, release the whole science but behind it, but the trees release things that make you in a more positive mindset and really help with the immune system. Um, and eat a healthy diet. Um, I know it, like for us emotional eaters, when you're dealing with the stress and horribleness of a job search, you tend to stress eat and eat your feelings, um, but you want to stay focused and eating healthy because that will make you feel better than if you're not. So especially those, those fruit and vegetables, which are the key. The other thing is being prepared. And this is with those tangible aspects that we were talking about. So the resume, the cover letter, getting the, your foundational work with your resume, cover letter and interview prep done. So that it's just a matter of tweaking, um, planning your week. I'll link to the dream career planner that you can use uh, so that you're making sure that you're hitting off on all the different things that you want. Uh, and Number three, the key, engage with people. Job searching can be very isolating. You're sitting at home, on the computer, all day long, on those job boards, clicking refresh, waiting to see those jobs, sending out job applications, thinking there's no point. Get out and talk to people. Uh, friends and family, definitely, but also networking. You gotta stay fresh in terms of selling yourself and in terms of your elevator pitch, in terms of talking with people you don't know, um, because it gets harder the less you do it. Uh, and then you go into an interview and all of a sudden it's been like two, two weeks. And you haven't had any real adult conversation outside of the, the house and you're all over the place because of that uh, or you over prepare. Uh, so keeping engaged with different people within your industry to help your, your job search. So the networking is kind of kills two birds with one stone um and the last thing is that the being happy piece so sometimes during a long job search it, it starts with a layoff or a difficult uh difficult termination uh, and then you're already starting from a mindset of sadness or anger or a feeling of self-worthlessness um because of that. Uh, so looking back and still being grateful for the job that you just completed um, and keeping up that sort of gratitude practice as you go along. So that when you do talk about previous jobs that maybe didn't end well or you and, the man you and your manager didn't really get along, that that negativity doesn't seep into the interview. Um, so thinking about reasons why that person that you, that manager that you hated, and I know we've all had them, about how they have helped you. Um, and you know what, even for me, uh, for my first uh, position at a university, um, I didn't, at the time, I didn't really like my managers. Uh, I don't like, it's weird saying this to where, you know, you can maybe ever eventually hear. Um, but now looking back and practicing that sort of gratitude practice, uh, I have realized now, always hindsight is 2020, how much they have formed who I am today in terms of my career and how much knowledge and information they imparted on me. Um, so now I'm very grateful for that experience uh, and for all that they've taught me. And that I feel that helps me talk about that whole experience in a more positive light 
which is only beneficial. So gratitude practice is one thing. Um, the other thing is find joy every single day. So I know when I was in between, when I got laid off from that first job and before I started at, at Kojiko, um, I relished having that time at home. And I filled it with doing things that I couldn't do when I was working. So things like going for a hike in the middle of the day, things like trying out new recipes that take most of the day or going for a bike ride or just going to Starbucks or just doing something like something that I couldn't do back then, going to Starbucks to read, not just to grab a coffee and go back to the office, but doing stuff that I couldn't normally do. And it was incredible. Um, yeah, another way to find joy is also to take aspects of your job search and move them. So if applying to jobs is the most stressful thing, then find a new place to apply for jobs. Go to the library, go to the Starbucks or a coffee shop, and use, use their Wi-Fi, buy yourself a good cup of coffee, set up in the backyard or put on some good music, create a nice atmosphere, light a candle, something to turn that negative, what was a negative part of your day into a positive part of your day. And I, I know it sounds like super airy fairy and out there, um, but believe me, things like that really come across in a cover letter. Things like that really come across in the email that you send. When you send it with an, a certain intention, that intention can come back in a great way. So ensuring that you're in that right, again, I'm going to overuse this word, but mindset and positive attitude will help. Um, and then also congratulate yourself every day, at least every week when you're doing your week in a review, think about all the great things that you have done. Give yourself a pat on the back because like this is probably going to be one of the hardest, most challenging times in your life, especially if you've been searching for over six months, a year, year and a half, two years. Um, it, it happens, um, but it will come. A job will come. I have a colleague that I worked with in the past. It took her four years to get back into her dream job, into her field. Four years. Now, she worked in another position uh, in the meantime, but she never gave up. She never stopped networking. She never stopped uh, putting her resume out there. And it happened, and she is over the moon and so glad she never gave up. So... Congratulate yourself on going through the, this challenging time. So that's my incredibly long answer to the how to stay inspired uh, during a lengthy job search. Uh, so just to recap, because it was so long, uh, it's all about how to reignite your search and get it to be uh, successful. Uh, and the tangible things you can do are looking at your resumes and your job applications, reviewing your networking strategy, looking at how your interviews have gone, and in terms of the emotional aspect, um, making sure that you are taking care of yourself in terms of being healthy, being prepared for anything that could come your way, and being happy. Okay, so the next question I had is about the resume. I get this one all the time as well. So has anyone ever been like scrolling through Pinterest and you see, I don't, maybe it's just because I get, I'm looking at resumes all the time, but I'm always seeing the beautiful resumes that they're posting. Like, this is the resume you need for 2018. This is that, that like super modern format uh, with your picture and all those like little nifty um, like icons and stuff. And so I get a lot of, do I need a, a resume like that? Most of the time, the answer is no. Honestly, there are very few industries, uh, very creative industries, where that could be beneficial. But most of the time, I'm going to say no. Um, the other really big thing is applicant tracking systems hate those resumes. I absolutely cannot make sense of most of it. So you are losing so much information. Uh, and the other thing is if you have a resume that's on to two pages, it the second page never looks good. <laughs> like, honestly, it, things just don't come down to the second page. 
Um, so even for a person reading it, it doesn't, it doesn't always translate very well. Um, so I would recommend you can have a template and format that's applicant tracking system friendly and person friendly that showcases um, some style to it. So it's use of color, good use of fonts, maybe use a couple of different fonts, using some banners. Um, I have a, a bunch of different types like that that look more modern and feel more modern and as a recruiter it makes them more likely to want to give you a call. Um, but at the same time get through the applicant tracking system. Because to me, I'm about the foundational resume. I'm all about making it super easy. And if you have your super modern resume and a resume that can be read by applicant tracking systems, it's kind of gets a little tough and difficult to follow both. Um, so I think it's just easier to have one. Um, but if you are in one of those creative industries, or, or if you're a new grad, or if you just really want and feel like that modern style is more, um, more reflective of your personality, then definitely have the two, but you're gonna need one for applicant tracking systems. And you can have a one pager that you would use in networking events or that you can hand off uh, to a person specifically during an in interview or uh, email if you know you're sending it to a specific email. So the other question that sort of comes with that is how do you make one of those templates? Uh, I've made one, I have one that I use very sparingly uh, and it took me uh, an awful long time <laughs> because it's, uh, it can be a little challenging trying to get everything right. Um, but Canva uh, has templates, so uh, that's C-A-N-V-A. Uh, I use Canva for all of my social media posts, all of the like graphics and stuff. Um, I, I use uh, Canva to make them, uh, but they have resume templates on there. The thing is, is once you have it created, you can't really, you can't edit it. Um, so if you need to edit and create a new one, you kind of have to just go back and create a whole new one. So it is, can be very time consuming. Uh, so to me, it's almost like a portfolio piece. You create one that you know you don't need to tweak. And then you have maybe have that second one for the applicant tracking system that you can tweak uh, a little bit more accordingly. Um, some other questions I had. Well, first of all, I should check. Oh, thank you. Oh, good question, Kara. Um, PDF and Word documents. The so Kara's asking, does tracking software read PDF and Word documents in the same way? In which format is better to submit? Not all applicant tracking systems can read PDF. Now, that is, I hear mixed signals, uh, but when I talk to uh, most of my friends within the talent acquisition community at large companies using applicant tracking systems, uh, they prefer to get it in Word documents because Word is easier for the applicant tracking system to read. But there are a couple applicant tracking systems, uh, one or two out there that read PDF better. So I know, I'm sorry, that's a non-answer. Uh, but I think the best bet is to send Word. Most recruiters I know, again, corporate, definitely agency. Don't send an agency a PDF. Uh, prefer Word resumes. Uh, it's a little bit easier uh, to scroll through, to open, uh, than a PDF, a little bit easier to share. Um, so I would recommend uh, doing a Word. Uh, even though a PDF does look better. Uh, and the other way to sort of cover your tracks is to submit both. Any other questions? I was just going to check before I move on to the next one. Okay. Um, I get a lot of questions um, in general. Uh, I only got one specific for this, but the informational interview, because I know I talk about it a lot. Uh, so the question I had was, um, I have talked personally about my most recent success, uh, but when did I, here let me, when did I become such a proponent of informational interviews? So uh, it happened in uh, just after university. When, so I wasn't, obviously I did not, like, I'm an introvert, did not want to do informational interviews, 
Um, but when I graduated university, my husband and I did a backpacking trip. And when I came back, I needed to get a job. And my father, you know, most dads know best, set me up, uh, set up an informational interview with, f with a couple of his colleagues that, or not colleagues, who his partners at the Rotary in Hamilton. Uh, so he set me up with one gentleman, Paul Chapin, at Goodwill, the Amity Group, um, because it was in the mental health field, um, and he thought it might be a good fit. So I went in, I did, you know, I still, you know, wanted to do a good thing, do a good job. So I went and prepared with all of my questions and all, uh, all of the things I wanted to know, um, and essentially asked all about the company, the different departments, how they service the community, what are the different ways that they service community, what do they look for, um, what are some of the challenges, the, uh, all of those sort of typical type questions. And then I asked if there were any opportunities and there weren't at that time. So I went home and just started, did the, the norm of, you know, looking, I think it was Workopolis at the time, whatever. Um, or like the, there was like the HRDC, is that it? I think the that job board to see if there are any jobs and just applying that way. Um, but the three weeks later, I got a call saying, oh, they have a contract that's popped up. Can I come in for an interview? So I went in for an interview with the director uh, for work placement advisor and used all of the information I gathered and just like pretty much in most answers told them all different stuff about my background that exactly fit based on what I learned from, from Paul in, in my um, informational interview and then got the job. And so from right from that, I'm like, hmm, maybe there is something to this. Maybe there is a reason why we're, we're taught all this. Uh, and I wanted to ex expand beyond this because I know for most people, they assume that the informational interview is only for new grads. Uh, but I know lots of people who have continued, myself included, who continue to do informational interviews. Uh, they're maybe called a little more coffee chats now, uh, where you're just finding out more, you know, you're just gathering some more information, getting advice. Um, and uh, I do think that, yes, they're great for new grads, but they're also still great uh, throughout your career. Uh, and like, I know, so... Like I know personally for myself too, that an informational interview doesn't have to lead to a job. Sometimes it is, simply is gathering information. Like after my son was born, um, I, I knew I wanted to get out of recruitment. It still took a few more years, um, but I didn't know where I wanted to go. And I was looking at different avenues. Uh, I didn't know if I wanted to go and say like rec recreational therapy or go back into the life skills counseling or if I wanted to become like a psychotherapist uh, and do like family therapy work or work with children. Um, so I just started doing informational interviews. I spoke with many different departments with the, through the region of Halton uh, who are, were amazing at getting back to me and, and chatting with me, uh, which I really appreciated. Uh, I volunteered. Um, I talked with some local psychotherapists and uh, psychologists and other family therapists just to gather a whole bunch of information. And from there, I realized um, that I wanted to be a psychotherapist and then I found out I was pregnant, so did not do that. Uh, I'm very glad I did not do that because I'm now very happy with the direction my career has taken. Um, but I realized that all those other positions that I talked about then I did not want to do them. Um, so I saved myself time and money and effort and education uh, and uh, going off on a tangent in terms of my career that would not lead me to where I wanted to be. So uh, informational interviews, sort of those coffee chats, they do more than just provide um, job leads. And that's when you're looking at them, as just really gathering information and gathering advice, it really helps you with uh, creating those future connections and, and getting those people invested in your career. So there's 15 minutes left. I know um, I was just wondering if there's any other questions before I 
join in on or go in on to one of the last one or two that I got. Okay. Um, you can just type in if there is any. Uh, the other thing, uh, the other question that I got was what is one of the biggest mistakes that you can make in terms of an interview? And I think I've gone through this before in terms of the, the never ever do this in an interview and how in, in one of my newsletters, how to get an instant no. Um, there are, honestly, the worst thing you can do is be late. Like really honestly, number one, if you're late, it really sets a bad tone. You're starting at a no. Um, so now that like life happens and I get it, things happen. So if you're driving and you hit a traffic jam and you think you're going to be late, then you pull over to the side and you text or you, you call them just to let them know because that will save it because then you're not starting in a no, you're starting in a neutral because you did the, the responsible thing. But if you are late, that's a big, big obstacle to overcome. Um, now, do you want to get to there too early? You also don't want to get there too early. You don't want them to feel like they are like putting you out by you waiting. You also don't want them to, uh, or you also don't want yourself to be sitting in the lobby getting more and more nervous because like, oh my gosh, it's coming and you're just sitting there, you're just waiting. Uh, so the ideal time to, to try and get there is five to 10 minutes before. And then you'll sort of have enough time to settle yourself, um, but without getting too antsy. Um, now, uh, that does lead to another question that I uh, received a few weeks ago. This is reminding me actually, is what do you do when you're at an interview and they are really late and you're sitting there for half an hour? How, to, how do you control your nerves at that point? This is a, a tough one and it happens. Uh, I know I, as a recruiter, I've had this happen to me before, like where I've done, not to me, but I've done this to people I've been interviewing. Um, now, as one thing to know as an interviewer, you're generally a little bit, you're very apologetic. Like you feel horrible that, that you've done this. Uh, so you're a little bit more likely to be open to things going awry uh, because you know they've been sitting there. Uh, so don't worry about that. Everyone, they, the interviewer feels rushed. You're going to feel antsy. So the awkwardness is just going to be there. So be like, prepare yourself for that and just be okay with that. Um, don't go when you're sitting there, don't continuously go over your answers. Okay. Um, and, but also you shouldn't pull out your phone and be distracted by that. Uh, so the, there's different things you can do. It depends on your style. Uh, you can think about your plans for the weekend. Uh, think about what you're going to make for dinner. Think about, um, like what you're going to do in the next week or two. You can think about your, your, your job search plan. So take a look at that like thinking about your week, if you have, a phone isn't okay, but if you have like a notebook, then you can take that out uh, and you can write some things down. For some reason, um, it they know you're you're doing something of value and not on like scrolling through Facebook uh, when you're using a, a pen and paper. So you can definitely do that and start planning some things out, just writing some things down. Um, if you did want to rethink some of the questions you were going to ask then that, that's also a good time to do that. Um, but it is uh, maybe ask for a cup of water, ask to where the bathroom is, kind of do something to distract you a little bit. Um, sometimes there have been times where I knew I was half, half an hour late or an hour late. There have been times where I was up to an hour late. Uh, so I would either text in between quickly or let the receptionist know to let them know so that they could go for a walk or get a coffee. Um, and so if they say they're going to be a while, then leave. Don't, it does not, doesn't necessarily look good or bad. It's like kind of a neutral thing if you stay, but for your own, uh, like mental wellness, uh, leave it if you can. Um, that's that question. 
Uh, I don't have any other questions. Any, um, any other final questions? So, just wanted to let you know, oh, there was, okay, I would have been getting a, there was another question, sorry, I've been getting a lot of questions about the career coaching packages. Um, so, I will link to my site that kind of describes them. Uh, these are the career coaching packages that have the 10% off birthday discount uh, for celebrating my first year, blah, blah, blah. Um, these are following my job search roadmap which is the introspection, the marketing plan, the job search, and the getting hired. Um, these are multi-session uh, packages where you and I work one-on-one -on, -one on that job search roadmap in a way that makes sense for you and your situation. So I have four, uh, four session package, eight session package, and 12 session packages. Uh, and it, each one depends on uh, entirely on your situation. If you are doing a full blown career change, usually a 12 week one is what makes the most sense because we really need to, to spend those three weeks on each, uh, on each part of the, the job search roadmap um, to really come up with a, a plan of action to land you that job in your new career, uh, in a different career. Uh, if you are uh, someone like we were just talking about today, where you have had a lengthy job search of six months, three to six months is the average job search length here in Canada. In uh, the States, it's six to nine months is the average. Um, and it has been proven by working with a career coach, you can assume uh, that that is reduced by 50%, which is pretty amazing. Um, and, and not this is in terms of just finding a new job, not necessarily a new career. So uh, if you are at that six months plus, you may want to consider uh, working with a, a career coach. Uh, and that would probably be maybe the four week package where or the four session package where we are doing that examination of what has, what you've been doing and what's maybe we can tweak and what we can work on. Um, and then we can uh, come up with a new plan of action. So my four week or my four session is typically going after uh, and working with those individuals. Uh, the other four set times the four session packages really work is if you are pretty sure you're going to have to go back to school. You just don't know what you're going to back to school for. And so it's purely a self-discovery uh, uh, sort of process that we're going through, purely just sticking on the sort of the introspection. Uh, and then with the offer to uh, put those four sessions toward an eight or 12. Um, and then eight is pretty good, uh, or eight, the eight session works really well for people who have uh, maybe some of the same challenges, but a little bit more time, and they really want to work through uh, some of those pieces, and they want to make sure that they have more than maybe one or two sessions on the interview. Maybe they want to spend two or three sessions or they want to uh, be able to prepare just for phone interviews, prepare just for hiring manager interviews, prepare just for um, executive level interviews. So more sessions allow for more in-depth coaching on, on those. Uh, but they're completely customizable to the individual. So that means that we spend as much or as little time in each of the steps of the job search roadmap as necessary. Um, that provides all of the, the sort of things that you need. So a lot of worksheets, a lot of checklists, and um, a lot of guides and training sessions, uh, the in-person and PowerPoints that I, that I send over. Um, and then we meet usually weekly or every other week um, some for the like incredibly motivated people who really need to get underway. Uh, I've done uh, two in one week, like tw twice a week. Uh, and sometimes that changes. I have clients where we meet every week and then sometimes we have to skip a couple of weeks because life, you know, happens. Um, I've paused clients while they're sort of just figuring things out and getting their life uh, back on track, um, and which is like normal. Okay, this is not a corporation. I'm a person. I understand these things happen to me. I've had, had to pause clients from my vacation, obviously. So um, that is essentially how it works. 
um, and I do installment plans for two sessions at a time. But that's essentially, I wanted to go over the career coaching packages since I did get quite a, a few requests about that after I posted about the 10% discount. Um, and how that also works is that expires uh, September 30th, um, but how it expires is, is the uh, coaching agreement just needs to be signed with the uh, two sessions, first two sessions paid for for the first installment. But we don't actually have to start until sometime in October if right now is not the best time with back to school and all of that. Well, I enjoyed the first Q&A. I feel a lot better than I did at the beginning when I was a little nervous. Thank you for coming. Thanks for our um, friends and family and clients and, um, and anyone else that came and popped on. Uh, thank you to the people who I know couldn't make it that asked questions, but who are going to watch the live later. Uh, and like I mentioned at the beginning and mentioned throughout, any links that I talked about will be, I will post in the comments. I will also be posting this on my website with the, with some like cliff notes of what we talked about, uh, and linking to anything as well. Uh, in fact, that's probably going to be my article for this week. Okay. Thanks, Kara. Uh, take care. Have a, a good rest of your day. Happy hunting.